This piece is titled, Existential Crisis, Civilization Reconfiguration or Species Suicide, Two Competing Trends. In this piece, I'm going to define the term existential crisis better, and then provide the bigger picture view by which multiple converging crises are placing humanity at a crossroads that may either lead to civilization's reconfiguration or to species suicide. Let's start with the term existential crisis. That's a rather hundred dollar term, isn't it? So I'm going to translate it into more bite-sized digestible language. Existential refers to existence, that is, staying in existence. Crisis refers to a turning point. Crisis, things may go in either of one or more directions. So when I use the word existential, which you may have heard used by certain candidates for the office of president, what we're talking about is the continued existence of human civilization and possibly even of the human species in its present form. And what we're facing is a situation in which there are two competing trends in human civilization presently and they're perfectly obvious if you pay any attention to the news at all. One of the possibilities is a reconfiguration of our civilization advocated and worked for by what are called political progressives and the other is the collapse of civilization and possible extinction of the human species or perhaps just a reduction to a stone age culture. This is not an exaggeration and I'm not being sensationalistic as I'll describe shortly. What we're seeing in American politics is a trend in dominance of the politics which is toward species suicide exemplified by Donald Trump who is the very voice and face of the existential crisis and calamity we are facing and Mitch McConnell likewise these two and their coterie of supporters ignorant supporters who are more attached to the enthusiasm cult around these figures than to any virtues that they provide. These figures are working against the survival of human civilization. It's pretty obvious. Just pay attention to Trump's denial of the climate shift while the evidence of the climate shift is mounting and apparently accelerating faster than scientists had predicted. You also see it in his foolhardy comments about the coronavirus and about the workings against the American population and the American democracy in such forms as intended repeal of the Medicare, uh, pardon me, the um, Affordable Care Act, threatening of Social Security, defunding public radio, defunding Planned Parenthood, tax cuts for the very rich at the expense of the middle and lower classes, working against neutralizing or canceling debt associated with education and many other similar behaviors. It's said that Mitch McConnell has some 300 bills passed by the House of Representatives moldering on his desk for which he will not allow a vote to occur in the Senate, one of which includes protecting the electoral process. While many Republican administrations in the states have been closing voting places and making it more difficult for people to qualify for voting and purging the voting rolls of legitimate voting citizens. You can see how these are all in effect, 
suicidal activities. They work against the well-being of the population and particularly in a time when the various existential threats I've mentioned, climate shift and the coronavirus being two major ones, require all hands on deck, require people to be able to function at their full capacity, not to be impaired the way the Republican Trump administration is impairing the American system. In this piece I'm going to say more about the existential crisis and what's happening in the American population and in fact worldwide human population in the face of these two impending calamities. I'm going to say more than just describing the calamities, I'm going to talk about the peculiar confluence or coming together of those two in particular and the demand that they require human beings to operate at their fullest intelligence and ability in order to get human civilization through these impending crises. There are specific effects that these two crises have along with the aforementioned what I call retrogressive or anti-progressive or anti-civilization or species suicide efforts of the Republican Party. All of these three present challenges that if met make it possible for our current civilization to forestall the worst of the calamities that are descending upon us and to pass through those calamities in a necessarily heightened state of civilization, substantially higher than the state of civilization at the present time. At the end of this piece, I'm going to provide access to a resource by which you can progressively dissolve your own stress in life, including the intense stresses triggered by the conditions I've just named and procedures that in the course of dissolving those stress patterns also heighten access to your own intelligence. In other words, I'm not just going to come down on you with a hammer. I'm going to ex explain the situation, give you a realistic view of what's going on, motivate you to take action, and then provide the means of preparing yourself creatively to take action as needed. So the three challenges that are confronting us each evoke either a situation of downward spiral or a challenge for humans to rise to the occasion. Let's start with the coronavirus situation. In the face of the planetary calamity of climate destabilization, it becomes altogether necessary for humanity to unify and rally together to integrate beyond national and political boundaries and to embark on intensive creative efforts to reconfigure our civilization to make us capable of managing to some extent and passing through the existential crises that face us. I'll say that more simply again. People need to come together all over the world, cooperate all over the world, and to remove the obstructions, the anti-civilization trend that could lead humanity and human civilization to a crash that would completely disrupt our energy grids, which includes, of course, communication, the internet, for example, and the knowledge base that that function, the internet, makes possible, and thereby reduce humanity, in effect, to a Stone Age culture. Wouldn't happen instantly. It would happen as a progress over a short period of time, probably some decades 
where all of the artifacts of our civilization become dysfunctional because we are unable to maintain them because our communication and energy grids have gone down under the force of the climate shifts and weather destabilizations, geophysical shifts, uh, epidemics, and other calamities that we must keep in check in order to maintain a working civilization. We need to come together cooperatively and remove those from power who are working against the survival of civilization as we know it and more than that working against the reconfiguration of civilization to the higher level needed to surmount these challenges. So I've stated what's necessary. Now I'm going to state how three major crises will either cause us to crash or challenge us to rise to the occasion. Here they are, the first one, coronavirus. Now, it's been called an epidemic, and there are those who are saying that it's already a pandemic. A pandemic is an epidemic all over the world. And it's easy to see the evidence if you pay any attention to the news whatsoever. What we're seeing now is the beginnings of the nations coming together in a coordinated way, for example, through the communications of the World Health Organization and in the United States of America, the CDC, the Center for Disease Control. But the efforts are increasingly worldwide. This coronavirus outbreak is a challenge for all of humanity to cooperate, to rise to the occasion. It's a signal that we are all interdependent and interrelated, transcending the interests of national sovereignty and politics, transcending economic advantage or disadvantage, and orienting us to humanity as a whole. So the coronavirus is threatening as it may seem is in a way a kind of merciful not so horrible despite the apparent severity of it not so horrible challenge to rally humanity to operate as a cooperative whole I think it's opportune just to make a mention now of the actions of the counter-progressive or regressive or anti-civilization trend in politics which works against that kind of world cooperation and shows up all over the world as right-wing so-called politics which is the politics of suppression repression ignorance consolidation of power and wealth in the hands of the very few These are the ones whose power must be nullified, from whom all power must be stripped. This, by the way, also includes the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, who perpetrate wealth inequalities between the first and third world nations. The third world nations must be empowered to do their part in surmounting the crises that are facing us. Otherwise, they'll remain pockets of residual adversity, residual detriment, re residual threat. In other words, if the third world countries are not empowered to manage the coronavirus outbreak, then they will remain pockets of that contagion that can re-spread. Likewise, the occupants of third world countries under threat will attempt to migrate to safer places as has already been happening, some 70 million as of this date. And this kind of mass migration 
creates crisis situations in the countries to which they migrate, not only from cultural differences, but from demand upon the infrastructure. And so the third world countries must be empowered to do their part locally in order for their citizenry to remain in place. So I've stated the unsuspected benefit of the coronavirus outbreak, and it is to rally the membership of the human species worldwide into cooperative efforts, and equally to strip right-wing, ignorant, backward, anti-civilization trends in the human population. In other words, it's not enough to put your foot on the accelerator. You've also got to take your foot off the brake and steer correctly. So that's sufficient as a summary of the effect of the coronavirus outbreak. All the other medical consequences and information are secondary to that. The coronavirus outbreak will either create a massive disruption in human civilization. Just think of the effects on commerce right away. Just think locally. If the coronavirus were to come to your locality, what would be the effect on businesses? What would be the effect on restaurants, for example, or theaters where people congregate? Or travel centers like airports? What would be the effect on services provided, such as waste removal, curbside garbage pickup? What would be the effect on the availability of necessary commodities? What would be the effect on food transportation? So I'm not exaggerating when I speak of a massive disruption to civilization. Just from the coronavirus outbreak alone, what we have already well underway is a climate shift. We've got massive meltdown of the ice caps, rising of ocean waters, and that's the least of it. That's the popular news version. That's what they highlight because it's dramatic in a way that people can see when they do filmings of, say, what's happening in the Philippines or Indonesia or in Italy, Venice being flooded, or in the United Kingdom where dis, uh, agriculture has been majorly disrupted, or for that matter, in the food belt of North America. Climate shift is well underway. What has come to my attention from certain YouTube videos is that the ice caps are major repositories of methane. Methane is a far more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide and one video that I saw said that the methane levels above the Arctic are either, and it doesn't matter which, they're both horrendous, either 2,000 times normal or 2,000 percent. Either one is huge and we're in the winter time right now where the melt-off is much slower. Imagine what's going to happen as temperatures rise as we head into summer. We had measurements in Antarctica of 70 degrees. Absolutely extraordinary. What will happen to the atmosphere and to the weather patterns as that methane is released into the atmosphere? So you see, we have a bit of a shocking surprise coming this summer. What happens where more sunlight gets trapped by the greenhouse effect is that the energy powering weather systems is increased and so the force of weather systems increases. And we have things like superstorms, tornadoes, strong tornadoes in places that haven't seen them before. Okay. Agriculture adversely affected. Droughts, we're also seeing plagues, massive locust plagues in Africa die-off of forests, 
spreading of the boundaries of deserts. These are all geophysical consequences of increased atmospheric energy from heat trapped by greenhouse effect. How can we possibly manage that where we have countries at odds with each other wasting their time on stupid male power games such as those played by Putin right now, Russia? What business do they have wasting their time and our resources meddling in elections? It's just a male masturbatory power game. This is intolerable and must be shut down. This is where I speak of the removal of right-wing influences from power positions or positions of control of wealth or communication. In other words, the people perpetrating those male power games, and it's generally male, far more than female, are one of the two competing trends, the anti-civilization trend, the self-serving trend, the trend of consolidation of wealth at the expense of the mass of the population, the expense being that when wealth gets consolidated or pooled in the hands of the few, it doesn't circulate, and it's that circulation that they call a strong economy. Consumerism is not the source of a strong economy. Circulation of wealth is the source or cause of a strong economy. So, people who are involved in abuse of capitalism are members of the trend anti-civilization, the ones who must be contained and stripped of wealth and power so that it can be applied throughout human civilization to meet the challenges that are facing us. I'm going to say now more about those competing trends. The progressive trend is recognizing the challenges that face us and the anti-civilization trend epitomized by Donald Trump and his brand of human being are working toward species suicide. Donald Trump may also be called wrong way Trump. A certain Republican political strategist by the name of Rick Wilson wrote a book, published a book called Everything Trump Touches Dies. Of course there are those who are going to argue the point that I'm making as fake news. Such people are like the ostrich sticking its head in the ground to avoid perceiving danger. The danger doesn't go away. They just become irresponsible about it. And as I said in another piece, the ostrich who puts its head in the sand to avoid the perception of danger gets eaten. So we have two massive trends in the human species. We know it's massive because the supporters of right-wing causes not just in the USA, but in Australia, South America, in Brazil, for example, and Europe, support the anti-civilization politicians. They do so out of a kind of backward, unevolved, unintelligent, immature, undeveloped human functionality. Lower, more backward, unintelligent and insistent on keeping their position. It's an entire trend that you'll have observed in the news. Such individuals even appear in political parties that traditionally or historically have been progressive. There has been a trend toward so-called right-wing politics and values. Again, this is the anti-civilization suicide or species suicide orientation. Now, the more progressive trend in human beings has been to recognize that anti-civilization trend, but people have been slow to become aroused. The dragon has been sleeping. It has gradually been awakening and gradually 
progressive individuals and progressive organizations have been waking up, but they have yet to coordinate with each other in a unified action. Failing that, the donations that they ask for separately get watered down and dispersed instead of focused. This is a disadvantage. They represent the trend towards reconfiguration of civilization. The term political revolution used by Bernie Sanders applies. I've published another piece earlier on why we must enact a political revolution. I touch on points related to those in this piece. My point is this, just to restate, the coronavirus outbreak has been a wake-up call to all of humanity that we need to mobilize in a unified, integrated, and coordinated way to confront calamities that confront the entire of species of humanity. All of humanity must rally in a coordinated way together, removing the obstructing influences of so-called right-wing or anti-civilization or species suicide trends among humanity. It's necessary that we take the foot off the brake as well as put the foot on the accelerator and steer correctly. So the coronavirus has been a wake-up call that we must all mobilize and cooperate and stay in communication. Climate shift has been the very motivation for people to do so because its effects would be massive and very likely return humanity to a Stone Age level of civilization and a vastly reduced population stripped of the protections of civilization. So the climate shift is a big motivator for the human species to progress, to evolve, and to nullify or throw off the anti-civilization species suicide trend that we're seeing in politics and in economics and in culture in general. The appearance of that right-wing anti-civilization species suicide trend in humanity has been part of the wake-up call as we confront the horrendous ongoing series of actions of these unregenerate individuals. In a way we might say that Trump has been exactly what humanity has needed in order to wake up and organize to confront the massive converging crises that face us. Climate shift being a major, maybe the, you know, well, I'd say absolutely the major one. I'm going to say a little bit about that right now that you will not have heard, I think. It's been said that the climate shift, the rise in carbon dioxide levels and methane levels in the atmosphere, have been a direct result of human activity. And while that's true, there is a larger cycle going on here, which is known as the glaciation or ice age and interglacial cycle. Ice ages occur generally about once every hundred thousand years and they end with what are called interglacial periods that is the ice age fades out and we end up with about 10,000 years during which the glaciers retreat and the climate returns to one much more hospitable to the life forms on this planet including humanity. There's also a theory called the Milankovitch theory, which states that the climate shift is a product of changes of the distance of the Earth from the Sun. And while that may be true, the mechanisms of Ice Age glaciation have nothing whatever to do with the distance of the planet from the Sun, but have to do with cyclic rhythms of the fertility of the soils of the planet and that has to do with the mineral content of the soils which contribute majorly to the fertility. 
There is a brand of coffee called Folgers, which advertises itself as mountain grown. Why? Because the soils of the mountains contain a far higher mineral content than those elsewhere. Food tastes better when grown in well mineralized soils because they have nutritional value. Flavor is the indication of nutritional value. We've all observed over the decades how food has lost its flavor. It's not that our taste buds have gone bad, it's that the soils have been depleted by petrochemical agriculture which uses fertilizers to force plants to grow and to produce fruit without remineralizing the soil. So the soils become depleted, then the plant life dies back, then rains come and in times when the soils are fertile they're held together by the soil microorganisms called mycorrhizae, that is the fungi which plants feed upon through their root structures <clears throat> and which hold the soils together. When they die off due to the loss of soil fertility, rains wash away the topsoil. And we've seen massive occurrences of that. And in fact, a historically available example of that is what happened during the Dust Bowl era in the Great Depression. Bad agriculture led to loss of topsoils and the Dust Bowl. This is just an example of something that happened on a relatively smaller scale that would happen on a worldwide scale as soils lose their fertility due to demineralization from natural cyclical causes. In the glaciation cycle, glaciers descend from the poles and in the course of their travel grind rock into dust, which then remineralizes the soil. The glaciers grind the rock to dust and then carry that dust across the continent. And then the soil being more fertile supports more plant life, which then draws the carbon dioxide out of the air into the soils and results in a retreat of the ice age or greenhouse effect so that the weather becomes more temperate. This is a very simplified explanation. There's much more that can be had. There's a book called The Survival of Civilization by John Hamaker, H-A-M-A-K-E-R, still in print. And he gives much more technical detail for people who have the appetite to read through technical detail. My point is this. It's not only human activity, but a geophysical, cyclical process that's leading to the destabilization of climate in the direction of ice age conditions. And if left to its own devices, it takes something around 100,000 years for the work of that planetary geophysical reset to occur so that an interglacial period supportive of civilization ensues again. So to summarize, the climate shift is not only the result of human civilization, not only the result of the Milankovitch effect, planetary distance from the sun, but from natural geophysical processes by which the planet renews itself. There have been many ice ages in human history, not human history, in planetary history. And the fossil evidence shows that there have been five mass extinctions of life forms on this planet, each succeeded by a type of life form at a higher level of evolutionary organization. Humans are the first species who have any potential of controlling this natural geophysical effect, not to stop it, but actually to place it under human control and accelerate it and to reduce the intensity that would affect a civilization. And I leave it to you to read The Survival of Civilization, which is a pretty definitive statement of what it would take to do it. Let's just say that the project described in that book 
fits what Marianne Williamson said about managing the climate destabilization as requiring a World War II magnitude mobilization effort that gets back to world cooperation, world communication, and removal of those who are acting out an anti-civilization species suicide trend. So to summarize, the coronavirus is a wake-up call to get the nations of the world and the peoples of the world to cooperate and to communicate openly. The corruption of politics by the right-wing anti-civilization trend is likewise a wake-up call to humanity as the atrocities of those kinds of government administrations rally the intent of humanity to control those right-wing anti-civilization trends, to strip them of power and wealth, and to enact an intercooperative world coordinated effort to cause our civilization to pass through and survive the impending calamities that is the existential crisis which has already begun for humanity. So corrupt politics has been another wake-up call. Changes of climate are the motivation, the volt, the wattage, the fuel to drive people into mobilization, which of course will also require stripping from the hands of the right-wing anti-civilization species suicide interests that control the mass information media, that means news media and the entertainment industry. So you see I'm talking about what has been described as not just an existential crisis but a world project whereby we can pass through these existential crises. Now to do so requires people to operate at a high level of intelligence. Stress impairs intelligence. It impairs thought processes. It impairs creative insight. It impairs foresight. And so I've developed and provided freely available procedures by which people individually can manage their own stresses and to liberate their own intelligence to function at a higher level. At the end of this video I have provided clickable links to explanations of those procedures, step-by-step -step instructions, and recorded video of the procedures themselves that you can follow and do the procedures at first so you can tell that they actually do what I've just said. They actually work to reduce stress, to balance the emotions, and to liberate higher intelligence and to develop intelligence beyond the limits of our previous conditioning. Proof of the pudding is in the eating. Do it once as instructed until you get the described result and by then you'll know that these procedures work and you'll have access to something that you can use ongoingly to help take your foot off the brake, put it on the accelerator, and steer correctly. I'm Lawrence Gold.